when exactly do courts, when applying the Second Amendment, consider 19th century history? You need to know the answer to this when we get back. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, a proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and New York Times best-selling author. If you have not subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner Second Amendment channel, please do so and show your love for the right to keep and bear arms. We'd appreciate it. All right, folks, I want to make this a quick one, really quick. We've talked about this before, but this is a very precise rifle shot on a particular topic. We know that America was founded in the 18th century. That's the 1700s, right? We declared our independence in 1776. We fought a revolutionary war or a civil war, America's first civil war, one could argue, against the British. And we ultimately won that war and gave rise to the United States Constitution in 1789 and 1791. The Second Amendment was ratified and went into effect in 1791. That's the 18th century. This is very important to understand this because the Second Amendment is to be interpreted based upon what the text of the Second Amendment meant in 1791, what did the public understand the Second Amendment to protect in 1791, and to the extent you're applying historical analogs to determine the scope of the Second Amendment, what were those historical analogs in 1791? Now, I have flagged that this is such a big deal now, understanding that 1791 is in the 18th century is mission critical because we know that the anti-gunners are trying to exploit something. They're trying to say that the proper time to interpret the Second Amendment from 1791 is after the Civil War in the late 19th century. That's the late 1800s. And the reason why the anti-gun community and the anti-gun lawyers are trying to exploit this argument is because there are more gun control laws in the late 19th century. Now, it's true that the gun control laws, most of which they point to in the late 19th century after the Civil War, during what's known as the Reconstruction Era, meaning Reconstruction of the United States after the Civil War, um, is a lot of those laws were basically you know, motivated by racial animus against the newly freed slaves, the, the African-Americans in the South. Uh, a lot of it was against the Confederacy because they just fought a war. So you had like Union officers sitting on the Texas Supreme Court interpreting the right of bear, to bear arms, so to speak, for the Confederates living in Texas, uh, all that sort of stuff. You had a lot of sort of anomalous history going on in the late 19th century uh, involving, among other things, gun rights. So, But that's where the anti-gunners want to go because they want to point to these anti-gun laws, even though a lot of them are just noxious in terms of their motivations, but they want to point to these late 19th century gun laws to justify modern day gun control and modern day gun restrictions in the 21st century, but they should not be allowed to do this. But again, the, the, the reason why I want to talk about this one very specific thing again is this. There are instances where the United States Supreme Court and courts are permitted, are permitted constitutionally to look to 19th century post-Civil War history and there's only one reason for that. That is because the Supreme Court and courts may look to late 19th century history and historical analogs to confirm the original understanding of 1791 Second Amendment. And what I mean by this as a confirmatory analytic, late 19th century post-Civil War history can be used to confirm the original understanding of the Second Amendment as it was enacted in 1791. It's a one-way ratchet. So this is very important because the anti-gunners like to say that the Supreme Court has looked at history after the Civil War, and because they looked at history after the Civil War, guess what? We get to do the same. But that's not true. What the Supreme Court did in looking at late 19th century history in Heller, in McDonald, in Bruin, and the like, is they looked to the late 19th century to confirm what the Supreme Court had already concluded was the meaning of the Second Amendment in 1791. So the 18th century understanding of the scope and the protections of the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms were, were set or pegged to the public understanding in the late 18th century, 1791. But then the Supreme Court went on and says, our understanding was further confirmed, for example, in the late 19th century by virtue of the fact that many people, when they enacted the 14th Amendment, which essentially granted privileges, immunities, and other rights and privileges uh, to the freed American slave, you know, the, the American slaves that were freed, the African Americans in the South, the Supreme Court says that a motivation there was to make sure that the freed slaves had all the rights of American citizens, including but not limited to the right to keep and bear arms, as it was understood in 17. 
91. So again, the fact that the courts sometimes talk about late 19th century should not be taken as an open invitation for courts to embrace this sort of anti-gun theory that they're allowed to look for historical analog gun control laws in the late 19th century to justify 21st century gun control laws because that's simply not true. It can only be used, and the Supreme Court has only used this as a confirmatory analytic. And there's two further examples of this. If you want further proof of that I'm completely correct on this, you can look at two cases, an older one and a newer one. The case you can look at for any judges watching this is go back and take a look at Brett Kavanaugh's dissent in the when he was on the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, D.C. Court of Appeals, he was still an appellate court judge before he was a Supreme Court justice. So when Judge Brett Kavanaugh dissented, wrote a dissenting opinion in what is known as Heller II, involving a so-called assault weapon ban, which is a semi-automatic rifle ban. So what Judge Kavanaugh said was that late 19th century laws and historical analogs and whatnot serves as a tradition, but it can only confirm or reaffirm the understanding of the Second Amendment 1791. Nothing in the 19th century, late 19th century, can undermine or undercut or shrink or cut back on the scope of the 1791 Second Amendment. That's what Brett Kavanaugh says. And also, just recently, in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, in a case called Range, which deals with nonviolent felons, we're going to do a whole video on this shortly, but if you look at the uh, case of Range, these were three, basically, in my opinion, I think it's kind of understood uh, in the legal profession, these were three judges who... I would say would be unsympathetic to gun rights. Uh, two of them were Barack Obama appointees. I think if you look at the track record of the three judges on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals that looked at the range case dealing with nonviolent felons in 2022, um, they of course said that uh, nonviolent felons could be barred from guns for life and they upheld 18 U.S.C. 922 G uh, on those grounds. But the most important thing about the range case was in the context of that, they essentially con agreed that the role of 19th century history is confirmatory. That's what they discussed about in range. So even though you had three, what I consider to be sort of gun skeptic judges on the Third Circuit uh, ruling against a gun control law, even they agreed that the methodology involving 19th century uh, case law, 19th century analogs, whatever you want to say, uh, can only confirm 1791 understandings. It cannot undercut it. Okay, so again, very important to understand this. We want to nip any of the anti-gun uh, arguments in the bud because as we've always known, uh, the old saying goes that a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth can get its pants on. And I, on this channel, I'm trying to nip in the bud uh, any of these kinds of anti-gun arguments uh, before judges get let astray. And as a result, our right to keep and bear arms gets undercut and shrunk in a way that it should not be. Okay, hope you learned something here at the Four Boxes Diner. If you have not subscribed, please do so. We're really trying to grow our numbers. We'd love to get to 100,000 subscribers. We're at over 70,000 now. We'd really like to get to 100,000 subscribers. That'd make a big deal for us and the algorithm, and we'd like for you to help us out on that front. And again, if uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Order's up. Table 2A.